Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being invited into your presence. We pray that you would take our scattered minds, our weary souls, our burdened hearts, and draw us to you. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence. Help us to receive you even as we are being received by you in your forgiveness and in your mercy and in your loving kindness. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak into the very needs of our hearts, for we are hungry for you. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> I began that prayer in part because, as my wife and I will attest, being the parents of five children, that sometimes it was a frenetic dash to get everybody ready to get to church on time. And it takes a certain level of almost shifting to sort of go from that kind of particularly caffeine-induced pace and, and sit down and, and just relax on the inside and be open to what God might want to do in you and through you. It's very, very easy, you see, to just sort of roll through the service. And it's all right here. You know the words, you know what to say, you know what to do, and you're there, and actually never allow an opportunity for your heart to speak to God. Much less for you to be able to commune with Him and have the possibility of hearing His voice speak to you through the lyrics, through the liturgy, through the scripture readings, or, or through the sermon. It, it takes a willingness to turn one's mind so that you're open to that beginning to happen in your life, especially if you've rushed to get here. And that's what most of us do. Um, so, and that's not just true on a Sunday. To be open to the will of God and actually God using you in the life of another person does require, and I mentioned this last night to a group here that got together for dinner, a certain level of inner silence where you know and are willing to enter into a God who actually loves you deeply and very, very, very much. So what I actually want to do is speak to that in a very specific way this morning in the sermon. And where I want to begin is yesterday. Yesterday morning, Oh, actually, no, a couple of weeks ago, I apologize. A bunch of us, actually, it was your diocesan deputation, those elected to go to general convention of the Episcopal Church that meets every three years, went this to up to Canuga, North Carolina, which is the Episcopal Retreat Center in the southeast. And we met with other deputations from around this part of the country to talk about, get to know each other, enjoy each other's company, and begin to talk about the things that will be presented at General Convention, which will be not this summer, but the following summer. Typically what happens is, we have a great time. I really like the people in this part of the church. And so there's a lot of fun around dinners and getting to know people, especially in the deputations. And then uh, usually the sessions are typically legislative, talking about resolutions that are coming up. And where do you stand on the re resolutions? which unfortunately has an automatic impact of kind of dividing people in a way that actually makes conversation sometimes difficult. There was on that list a, very, a lot of options, one on human trafficking. Now, you need to know that's a subject that has some interest for me. And the reason it does is because Central Florida, particularly sort of from Orlando to Ocala, is one of the top 10 centers of human trafficking in the United States. It's huge. And what I mean by human trafficking is mostly women, but sometimes men, are in essence put in a position of forced labor. More often than not, that means prostitution, but it's not limited to that. It can be actually au pairs, or people have been brought into this country on one pretense and wind up serving in another. I, I still remember we going into the local Burger King, no Wendy's, I'm sorry, not far from where we used to live in Pennsylvania, and beginning to get to know the manager a little bit, 
Turned out he was from Eastern Europe. He had, in fact, a CPA degree from a university, and he thought he was coming to the United States to get experience in American business, only to find himself all but captivated because he thought he was going to get paid serious money, which he did not get working the fry station at a Wendy's. And when I talked to him, I wound up going to a rented house owned by the owner, where there were like seven or eight guys all in that very same position. So while we often think of prostitution, it's certainly not limited to that. And they were trying to find a way to get the money together so that they could get back out of the country again. It wound up actually being highlighted in a story in the local paper. But so when I go to this session, my interest is up. I want to hear what's going on. Are we going to produce, create some kind of effort to deal with this you know, as, as a church? What I found was instead of it being a session that was legislative in its focus, there were two women up there who told their stories. And they were part of a ministry based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Two very, very different women. One woman was in some ways what you might suspect would be true for a lot of the women who get in prostitution. This was a woman whose mother was a drug addict, single mom, and very, very early she was, in essence, brought in to work the streets herself, starting, if you can believe it, at the age of 12, so that she could help support her mother's drug habit. The other, very, very different in background. This was a woman who grew up in a Christian home, who had, in fact, a college education, who wound up getting involved in sort of low-level recreational drugs after college and went very quickly to crack. And in going to crack, lost everything to support a drug habit, both of which were on the streets. They, through a ministry called Magdalene House, in essence, found themselves in a position, really for the first time, in a place of safety where they could be healed, where they could be prayed for, where they could get professional help for all that they were going through, both in terms of counseling, as well as in terms of the physical life, and literally relearning what it means to be a human being. Now there are entrepreneurs. I mean, their testimonies were just phenomenal. Earning money, in fact, to help support the ministry that they were now involved in. And this this ministry was, in fact, being populated in other parts of the country. I thought about that yesterday because uh, I'm on Twitter, and I read this on my Twitter feed. It's a quote from an author I follow in England by the name of Mark Stibbe. And he wrote this. He said, God is a safe house for the battered, a sanctuary during bad times. The moment you arrive, you relax. You're never sorry you not. That's what I think about when I think about what it means to be in the presence of God. That no matter where I've gone, no matter where I've been, no matter what I've gone through, when it comes to being in the presence of God, I, as His redeemed child, am welcomed. I'm invited in. In Him, there's no condemnation. There is instantaneous forgiveness. And it seems to me to be in that presence is to know immediately that you belong. And that there is no condemnation. That's, turn in your leaflet, I want to show you something. That's what's being said if you look in, right in the second page. W2, under Collect of the Day. I want you to look at the second phrase. The first is, Lord, in essence, help us to love you and to serve you. And it says, for what? You never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. It is that sure foundation of God's loving kindness which is what I think of when we are invited into the presence of God. I, you see, it, it completely just shoots to pieces. The whole idea 
that somehow if I'm good enough, then maybe God's going to answer my prayers or pay attention to me in some way. Or that if somehow if the good outweighs the bad, maybe I'll be in a better place of God's favor. Um, if that's how you're living, you're sunk. You're sunk. I, mean, I was talking last night to some of these people who are interested in ordination. And I said one of the disciplines that is incredibly important to Christians is to cultivate a real discipline of personal transparency. And the reason I said that is because we lie to ourselves a lot. And a part of the way we lie is that we lie about our true condition. I mean, the fact that, the, in fact, you almost have to get with some group like AA or something like that to be with a group of people who are actually just dead honest about what's really going on in their life. Or as I was a couple of weeks ago, I was in Sumter Prison with a group of people. There's a service that's held there every Monday evening. It's an Episcopal service. And I was invited to go and confirm five inmates who were making a renewed commitment to Christ, just like this group here. Well, you get with these people who are in prison, for some of them probably the rest of their lives. And, and they, are, they go for broke. They have nothing to lose. So when, they, when you talk to them, there's a whole different level of honesty in their conversations that happens than what happens on a typical Sunday morning. Because we're still under that kind of mistaken notion that if I look good and act good on Sunday morning, then people, maybe they won't discover the real stuff that's going on in my of my life. And that way I can live in a certain level of charade about who I am before my Christians and brothers and sisters, but who I actually am on the inside of my hearts. That kind of acting has everything to do with a lack of really understanding the sure foundation of God's loving kindness that he has placed within us. Because it's, it's right in here. You see, that's what's illustrated by the story of Hagar in the Old Testament. Rest the if there's anybody who doesn't qualify for the loving kindness of God, it's Hagar. She's not Israelite, so she's not an inheritor of the, problem, the promises of Israel. She taunted Sarah after she had a baby, but Sarah was barren, and therefore there was all of this back and forth. You know, I've got a kid and you're done. And in that culture especially, there was that sense that if, if a woman bore a son or a child, especially a son, that she was under God's favor. On the other hand, if a woman couldn't bear children, that meant she was under God's curse. In other words, it was actually a statement about her moral character. And so when finally a, new, a son, Isaac, was born, no wonder Abraham's wife wanted to get rid of her. And so it happened. But it happened because God spoke to Abraham that says, I I'm working through this and I'm actually going to make this son, Ishmael, a, a whole great nation. As Hagar didn't hear that. Hagar only knew that she was literally cast out of the entourage of this hugely wealthy nomadic family under the patriarch Abraham. So when she gets the bread and the water and she heads out on foot into the desert, she thinks we're both going to die. I have been excommunicated. Which is no wonder when finally the water runs out and the bread's long gone. She puts her son under a little piece of shade and then walks a bow shot that's like 50 to 100 yards. Because she doesn't want to hear the baby wail and die. Can you imagine anything more heartbreaking, women? And she begins to weep before God because this is it. We are cursed and we are gone. And God sends an angel, intervenes and says, No, I have a different promise. And it's for Ishmael and for you. He's going to be a great nation. And then, of course, she sees and almost as if in a vision, what she hadn't seen before, this well, and sure enough, Ishmael, the Egyptian, becomes a great nation. That is an expression of the very loving kindness of God to those who at one level do not in any way qualify for God's goodness and mercy. But you see, the thing is, is that that's us. That's the women that I'm describing that were a part of this halfway house. As one person said, and I love this, they went from being call girls 
to called girls. And you see, so who's Hagar? You and me. And it will always be so. Anything else is pretense. And what is the sure foundation of his loving kindness that he has placed within us? That's where you go to the epistle. It's both death and resurrection. Because that's what we receive from God. Death, but something that literally is poison, not to us, but to the sin that is within us. In other words, God has put in us, in his nature, something that literally is killing sin. Think of chemotherapy with no side effects. In other words, something new is being worked in us, and we are in fact being shaped, not just in terms of death and sin, but also in terms of resurrection and life. God is putting a new life in us. What does it say in later in Romans? That the very same Spirit which raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, beloved, that is power. That is tremendous power. And that's what's inside of everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and is saved. Everyone, without exception. So that what is at work in us right now, both God shaping us and killing sin, as well as God working in us a resurrection life that's changing who we are and literally fitting us for eternity by putting the very purity and power of eternity right in here. That's where it is. So you, if you know the name of Jesus, already have within you that sure foundation of his loving kindness. It's there. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to act good enough to receive it. You don't have to be holy enough to be able to access it. It's a given. It is a given. And when that begins to be within you, there is inside of you that capacity to know more and more of his peace and the companionship of his presence, but because you're no longer worried about whether or not you're good enough to receive it. You're able to let go of some of the freneticism and that pace that's just driven. You begin to let go of some of the cynicism and the constant kind of criticism of others that always is the fruit of someone who is unhappy inside. And the winsomeness and the grace and the mercy of God becomes in a new way as you yield to it the real fruit of your life. But as Jesus said, I have come to have life and to give it to you that you might have it abundantly. Or in this gospel reading, why are you so worried? You, even the very hairs of your head are, your, are numbered. You are valued far more than even many sparrows. Do you hear that? <sighs> I'm his. I belong. I'm welcomed. There is no condemnation. I can serve him. I can enjoy being his child. That's really the message. The fruit of that sure foundation is knowing that you can and are enjoying being his child. Let us pray. Lord, in the midst of a sin-soaked culture, driven by performance, driven by greed, driven by a frenetic pace to get ahead, I pray that you would rise up within us and shield us from these assaults of the evil and open our hearts and our <coughs> minds in new ways to the depths of what it is that you have placed within us as your children. That we might know more and more of the companionship of your presence. That we might enjoy being your children wherever we are, wherever we go. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.